Welcome back to Uncharted X. This is Ben, and I hope that you're all doing well out there. The Red Pyramid of Dashur is the third largest of all of the Great Pyramids in Egypt, only slightly less massive than the Middle Pyramid at Giza, and it's a remarkably well-made structure, with three huge megalithic chambers, each of them featuring soaring corbelled ceilings. In this video, we're going to take a full tour throughout this structure. The Red Pyramid stands around 105 metres or 344 feet tall, with a base measurement of 220 metres or 721 feet, and consists of around 1.7 million cubic metres or 2.2 million cubic yards of stone. The term Red Pyramid is a modern name, which comes from the reddish hue of the limestone that makes up its core, but originally it was cased in the same fine white Tura limestone as is the Bent Pyramid, and as were the two large pyramids at Giza. Despite these impressive attributes, it's something of an enigmatic structure. Very little is truly known about it, and in general it receives only a small fraction of the attention its more famous siblings at Giza do, and this statement holds true both historically and today. Despite being open to the public, not that many people make the short trip out to Dashur. Every time I've visited the mighty Red Pyramid over the past several years, there are scarcely any other tourists on the site. Historically, there has been no truly accurate survey ever made of this pyramid. At no point in recent centuries has its base been fully cleared of rubble, and in fact this rubble from the quarrying of its casing stones still exists today. The modern staircase built to access the pyramid's entry has just been laid down over the top of it. Despite being explored and documented by pioneering Egyptologists like Howard Weiss, John Perring and Flinders Petrie in the mid to late 1800s, the sum total of their writings would barely fill out a couple of pages worth of text, and the internal chambers were not fully cleared until the middle part of the 20th century. Amusingly, Petrie had to abandon his exploration of the Red Pyramid due to the local wildlife taking up residence inside the structure. Given that he was both alone and unarmed at the time, he wrote that, quote, a pair of hyenas with a family might have proved awkward acquaintances, end quote. Italian scholars Maragioglio and Rinaldi investigated the Red Pyramid in the 1960s, but many discrepancies and disagreements on specific measurements still persist. For example, there are accounts that suggest that the lower two chambers of the structure are at ground level, while others say they're slightly below it, and yet more accounts say they're around 3 metres above it. We don't know if the pyramid is built on top of a mound structure, like the Giza pyramids are, or if its foundations are built on flat ground. There is also an enduring mystery concerning the Pyramidian, or Benben stone, with conflicting accounts and measurements from various sources, and these are but a few examples of the discrepancies in our knowledge of this ancient structure. The uncertainty surrounding the Red Pyramid is most definitely extended to its origins and its attribution. If you cast around on the internet or ask Egyptology, you'll find the Red Pyramid firmly attributed to Sneferu, the first pharaoh of the famous 4th dynasty and the father of Khufu, who supposedly built the Great Pyramid at Giza. Many people are sceptical of the claim that Khufu could have built the Great Pyramid in only 25 years but perhaps less people are aware that his father Sneferu seems to have accomplished a far greater feat, that of constructing not one, but three great stone pyramids during his reign. The stepped pyramid at my doom, which was once a true pyramid whose exterior collapsed in antiquity, is attributed to Sneferu. As is the mighty bent pyramid, said by Egyptology to have been a failure or a mistake that caused Sneferu to then go on to build the red pyramid some two kilometers away. Despite this being recited in textbooks and on Wikipedia as established fact, there are problems, unknowns and discrepancies everywhere in this account of Sneferu's work. Likely far more than I have time to fully cover here, it's probably something for a dedicated video in the future. I've explored the overall orthodox timeline for the mega pyramid builders of Egypt and explained why I think it's a very unlikely proposition in another video on this channel, and I'd recommend checking that out if you're looking for a bit more background on the timelines here. There is still broad disagreement in Egyptology as to the length of Sneferu's reign, anywhere from 20 to 45 years. In something of a chicken and egg style problem, the fact that Egyptology unequivocally attributes these three massive pyramids to him has forced academia to extend the length of his reign in order to account for the time it must have taken to build them. And even then, it requires quite a stretch of imagination. 
Something in the order of 3.5 million tons of large stone blocks were involved in the construction of Sneferu's three pyramids. And over a stretch of 25 years, that would require a little more than 380 tons worth of shaped, finished blocks being put into place every single day across those 25 years. Not counting the surveying, planning, foundation work, ancillary structures like satellite pyramids, causeways or temples, or any of the myriad of other activities involved in pyramid building. Sneferu was also a very active pharaoh in terms of fighting wars and expanding territories, so it's not like running one of the world's largest construction projects was the only thing that he had going on. It's a huge logical and logistical challenge to the orthodox timeline, and Egyptology has really painted itself into a corner with the claim that Sneferu did all of this work during his time on the throne. Then there's the whole pyramids are tombs nonsense. You have to ask, just how many massive tombs does one guy really need? We know what Old Kingdom tombs look like. There are many of these that you can go visit, those of royalty, nobles, and even kings. They are wonderfully decorated, painted, and inscribed. Yet not a single inscription or decoration has been found inside the Maidum, Bent, or Red Pyramid. If the Maidum and Bent Pyramid were failures during their construction, then why were they ultimately completed and finished? Surely abandoning them or reusing their blocks would have been a much more logical move. The Bent Pyramid in particular is labelled as a failure or a mistake by Egyptology, in an utterly stunning display of engineering ignorance. As if something as incredible as this structure could have simply been made up as they went along, only to collapse because it was too steep and then have its slope angle changed again on the fly. And the idea of saying that the pyramid, the pent pyramid, a mistake happened, that is very strange to accuse the pyramid builders that they made such a mistake. Who can do half of the, of the work if we will make it in two steps, the, the, the base and then the, the second part? Who can achieve that perfect work with all the smooth layers and all the... Uh, the huge blocks, that is not a mistake because they, they don't randomly choose the angle or they are not like amateurs that they claim. And by the way, according to Egyptology, this is the pyramid number uh, number four, number three. Yeah. The step pyramid, Maidum pyramid and the pent pyramid. That's why they say they were still beginners. So they couldn't understand that the angle is going to be so high the edge will be so high, so they may uh, felt afraid that the pyramid will collapse. Okay? And yes, why they didn't dismantle this and use the stones to build the other one? Why they puzzle themselves finishing this completely, or at least leave it? They would leave it and they start building another one. But they finished the pent pyramid completely and all the corridors and the rooms from inside and everything as if it will be used uh, according to the, to the Egyptology as a tomb for the king and then they start building the second one mm. and the fact is my doom pyramid we just talked about they relate also to Sinefro or to his father or father-in-law mm. and he finished finished the, uh, the the pyramid so how many pyramids the king have yeah, they were still practicing yes. and he finished three uh -huh. pyramids, three pyramids. <laughs> and this again is the story being a, per being a tomb because why he built two yeah. Oh, okay. oh. In recent decades, at one point, they drilled into the bent pyramid around the change in angle in order to look for proof of some form of collapse, only to come up utterly dry. Yeah, the bent pyramid was also studied by a group of um, researchers from, um, and I watched that documentary. Uh, from uh, National Geographic and uh, the one of them and this is one of the real uh, wrong style of research is to have the idea in your mind and go look Before for the study. evidence yeah, to yeah, support yeah. it yeah. not go study the, uh, the, yeah. and then come out with an idea mm. you know what I mean so yeah. his idea was simply if I am building and then the pyramid started to collapse then I'm gonna you know finish it change the angle and do the casing but in this case to to have the proof for his theory he was going to find that the outside casing is straight 
But the inner part is going to be bent because it was, you know, falling on, yeah. its, on itself yeah. in the inside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they did the tests with the sonic equipment and stuff. And yeah. in the end, it was a straight on the inside. So he said, no, yeah, he's wrong. Yeah. But why do we want to focus that it's a mistake? No, it's the same thing like thinking the stones huh, cannot be accomplished boring. because we didn't find Again. it. You have shortage in the data. And you want to explain everything based on what you have. The same huh? conflict, the same conflict of the copper chisel. The pyramid was ultimately finished and cased with fine white Tura limestone in an amazingly precise fashion. In fact, today it stands as the pyramid which is most complete, with most of its casing stones still in place. It obviously wasn't abandoned by its builders due to some form of collapse. Yet, right down to this day, the idea that the bent pyramid was somehow a failure is used as the primary justification to insist that Sneferu then decided to build the Red Pyramid. There is no real doubt that Sneferu did in fact work on the Red Pyramid at some point. Some of the casing stones on the outside do have graffiti that bear his mark, as well as dates during his reign, such as, quote, bringing to earth in year 15, end quote. There is dispute whether this sort of year counting is annual or biennial counting, and it's a further source of disagreement as to the overall length of Sneferu's reign. Given the utter lack of any inscription on the inside of the structure, this graffiti may only be evidence of Sneferu's repair work on a structure that could have already been immeasurably ancient. Unless we figure out a reliable way to date stone, we'll never really know for sure. Given the monumental logistical challenges of the Orthodox timeline, as well as the many, many logical inconsistencies with it, I tend to lean towards the inheritance, repair, renovation, and kings claiming it for themselves approach, but I'm certainly open to new evidence and I'm continually researching this subject. I do find the whole Sneferu timeline to be fascinating. In fact, if anybody knows specifically what evidence ties Sneferu to this structure, other than the graffito on some of the casing stones, I'd love to hear it. You'd think that this type of information would be easy to find, but it's not. Searching for this on the internet just reveals endless assertions that Sneferu built the Red Pyramid, but beyond the few bits of graffiti, I've yet to see specifically why. If there are any Egyptologists out there who can help me understand this, I'd love to hear from you. Nothing has ever been found inside the structure, at least in our times, as the pyramid was opened at some point in antiquity, possibly as early as the Greek-Roman period. In the 1950s, some human and animal remains were found during an excavation and clearing inside its chambers. Zahi Hawass, in his book Valley of the Golden Mummies, published in 2000, states that these remains were in fact of Seneferu, but according to Keith Hamilton's investigation in his excellent and highly recommended Layman's Guide to the Structure, there is literally nothing at all backing up this claim. And in general, Egyptology seems to have ignored Hawass's claim here that these remains were in fact of Seneferu. I'm a scientist. I'm a scientist. It's been 21 years now since this claim was made. They still have these bones and remains. You'd think that they might have done, mm, I don't know, maybe some radiocarbon testing by now? Perhaps, just perhaps, these results maybe weren't what they wanted to see. It seems to me, much like the testing of the red ochre paint in the upper chambers of the Great Pyramid, or finding any trace whatsoever of wooden sleds beneath the Serapeum boxes, that this is another case of the silence from the mainstream speaking volumes. What I'd like to do in this video now is to share with you a full private tour into and through the chambers of this incredible structure, with my good friend and guide Yusuf Awen. The acoustics inside the pyramid are, well, perhaps strong is the right word, so I've added subtitles to much of the discussion. I'll also offer my opinion and some more details at several points throughout the tour. I was privileged enough to have Yusuf, who along with being a stonemason and guide is also a very talented musician, play his Egyptian flute in the first chamber, and I wanted to share that recording with you all as we enter the amazing Red Pyramid at Dashur.
Entering the first two chambers on the north-south axis, there's a couple of things to immediately notice. One is that the modern restoration of the pyramid has entirely covered the masonry beneath our feet with a wooden floor. There were a couple of excavations made into the floor of these chambers. In fact, these are shown on Rinaldi and Maragioglio's original drawings of these spaces made in the 1960s. The other thing that I'd point out is the massive size of the blocks that sit over the passages that lead into and out of these chambers. I would estimate these are something like 70, maybe 80 tonnes. That's wonderful. <laughs> Designed to be rough. Also, the bent pyramid from the inside is rough like this. And some of the walls and the, uh, and the grand gallery. I know for sure that if they wanted this wall to be smooth it's like a mirror, it's not. It's not like the hardest thing they're gonna accomplish. Definitely rough like this, almost lift rough like this. That ceiling is simple. It's yeah. supposed to be something that they began with, something simple, that doesn't anything be simple. No. It is not simple. It's not simple. I don't know, you, yeah. This a gabled ceiling. Yeah. Should be to that same record that we also saw in the Great Pyramid. Under every line, there is a liquid, dark liquid leaking down in, the, in all the woods, as you can see here. It's not bad. <laughs> it's yeah, not bad. It's not bad. <laughs> Yeah, well, bats don't shoot upside down. Yeah, exactly. The way it gathers, the way it follows this straight line, and the way that the under the angle is straight, there is none. Hmm? I see. Looks like it's being created with a pattern. No writers, as you can see, except for some graffiti that was added in the 18th century. Which means that this must have been built in the 18th century. <laughs> this block here? Yeah. yeah. This block here. That's massive. Yeah. And why all the entrances and the portals? Hmm? Yeah. And why have the three chambers here? What is the sarcophagus? If this was a banner, this was a tomb. What is the sarcophagus? What is the use of the higher chamber? Knowing that originally it's not accessible. Wow. So what is the purpose of creating it? Why is it aligned the east west while the two other chambers are aligned the north south? Hmm? Not one Function. name written, not one uh, symbol written. Hmm? Even by the as they call them the the workers of the Yusuf makes a good point here. We do have some of the graffiti on the casing stones on the outside of the pyramid, but there's never been anything found on any of the blocks on the inside, and there have been blocks torn up from the floor. You can see on the inside surfaces of blocks, there's no graffiti anywhere from any of the gangs on anything on the inside of the pyramid, as far as we know. Does it seem that this kind of line is as long as the area? Hmm. Maybe it is, but maybe more more possible than it is. But for sure, the other type of stone that used to be casing the panel is much whiter, which shows if it's not yeah. the same type of stone. So, is there any granite in this? Is that passage like granite? No. It's all limestone. It's and the interior is a different design. We cannot understand what is the function of it. But someone, the ones that require that type of stone, then they had it. It's about that. What you are trying to accomplish. Perhaps the other structures front of it contain like what we just saw, the read and basalt for like shattered pieces. Yeah. Yeah. So 
Yeah, if this is a local store and they are really worried about it and they are going to get like more of a fine type of limestone for the case. And if the other one was a mistake, Muhammad Rahim always like give us this like bring this to our attention. If the other one was a mistake and nobody was going to use it, then why wouldn't they dismantle the stone from there and use as much of it as, they, as much as they can in this one. But of course, when you have the heart, it's not the same. That's a great project. It's a massive. You see, without this leather, steps leading up to that chain. Then the, it was never meant to be accessible. Accessible, yeah. It's functional. So it must be functional. It had to be, right. but if we follow the, the, the official teachings, what is the use of that chamber up there? Huh? If a tomb raider came all the way here, he's not gonna stop at this point. Huh? Right. It's definitely not me to mislead the tomb raiders. <laughs> and it's definitely also not a very good shape because why would the priest climb this and how would they climb it actually if they wanted to go and do it and use the higher one as the value? Yeah. Here we can find the evidence until today this is very new and they should be watching for this. Mm. Somebody, his name is Ahmad, just wrote his name here huh? mm. to claim his right as the pyramid builder. <laughs> Someone scratched But him. before him, uh, yeah, drove, drove, drove it. it. Drove it. Sometimes you find the name. Fabe. Fabe. Felby. Sometimes you find the name of famous people that now they are mentioned in history, like Belzoni. Uh, like, uh, I know. Or well, Napoleon, right? Napoleon, definitely. He is the I built that pyramid in 1832. <laughs> <laughs> it was made in London. 1832, London. Yeah. yeah. So if you just find here a name says Sinefil, does it mean he's the builder? We didn't even find it. <laughs> of course, this is something of an ongoing joke. It does relate back to how Egyptology tends to date and relate objects and places, typically by the last person who really wrote on them. So, you know, in a lot of these sites, we see graffiti. Uh, how do we know this guy wasn't the one who actually built the pyramid? Uh, it's a point that I make in a lot of my Serapium videos. But it is how modern Egyptology tends to date and relate objects and structures. It's by the writing that's on them. So now we're about to climb up the ladder that leads up to the third chamber, which is on the east-west axis rather than the north-south axis that the first two chambers were on. And as we proceed up the ladder, we can get a better look at some of the staining or the liquid or whatever it is that's on the walls of this pyramid. It's, it's a little mysterious. I have heard people mention, uh, Keith Hamilton and his guide thinks that it could be bat urine. Uh, I really don't know what it is. I'd, I'd love to know if there has been any analysis done on this liquid uh, and, and what it might be. But I can't find any answers as I've searched around for it. Yeah. That liquid looks like after... It's the same like that was around, but it's more. It looks like it, it came out more when the stone was broken here. This is probably what they did to, uh, to do later uh, like, uh, steps so they can climb. Yeah. Let's go. Oh, yeah, right. That must have been the deal yeah, to, put, to put something in. When they did it, as if the stone more that material. Is it in the stone? Or is it just on the surface? <laughs> this is the paint from the wood. Varnish. That straight line 
Yeah. And then everything leaks down. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Ooh. Well, isn't it true? To... Yeah. I mean, didn't they find in the, the so-called Queen's Chamber in the Great Pyramid was covered in an inch or so of salt? Like there's a residue from the chemical reaction when they cleaned that off in there, right? We so cannot be sure everything was cleaned or all these things, what it is. But there's still a big, a thick layer of salt glaze here in this pyramid. Some suggestive of a chemical reaction, isn't it? I believe so. You see here, that's the natural color of the stone. Oh, yeah. So it's not naturally this color, but it transforms. It can be iron oxide, this is a very common thing. But the liquid, the iron oxide will, will usually give you like red see. patches. You can really That's see it. Like this. Yeah, and you can really see it under here, yeah? Like underneath this lip. Yeah. yeah. So people would be coming up and down or moving things down, getting rid of things. What we see here clearly is that this part here was enlarged. Yeah. Because it, the tunnel used to be only from here to there. Until just here. Regular pyramid tunnels, right? Yes, even narrower than most. Hmm? Mm. So somebody chiseled out. Chiseled this out. Treasure hunting, of course. Mm. Naturally. The ceiling stone in this part is not one piece. It is half of it this way and half of it that way. Well, they put these things here to see if the cracks is going bigger. Yeah, right. Stuff. I what you going to do about it? Well, at least you know if the crack's getting bigger. <laughs> I'm not going to do much about it, but at least you'll know. <laughs> so the floor, when you can feel the smell is getting stronger when we come here. Hmm? Yeah. The floor was until this level. And you can find here that under the floor is that thick layer of salty glaze. Hmm? Yeah. Oh, it is too. It's, like a, oh. it's a real residue. What is that? Salty glaze, it's called. So it's just from ex like exposure to humidity, that's the theory, over time? Probably Limestone? The stone is shutting its, uh, its moisture out with the salt in it. You can find up here how, how it forms, huh? on that wall, for example. We can not date also, like this part here, you see it, it's fizzy. The salt itself is, oh, yeah. is like fizz. Huh? Sometimes this forms in, in a very short time. Sometimes, yeah. in some case, depends on the on the what is conditions. And the conditions, yeah. yeah. It depends on the conditions. Like underneath the statement of Zosa, there is a, shine a light. Yeah. There is a huge amount of uh, halite. It's also a form of salt forming under, and I asked it. Our friends Sally and Robert Chuck about how how long would it take to form. So they said we cannot have a, a, like a, a dating a timeline according to that because it depends on the circumstances, it depends on the conditions how it can form. 
uh, faster. Sometimes it can take a thousand years, it can take 50 years. It depends on the... Yeah. Here we can see that this also is the level of the floor originally in this chamber. Yeah. You see? Yep. That level all around, and you can still see part of the corner over there. Yeah. So somebody also wanted to dig. Removed and digged big amount of stone from here. Why? Is this what was here? Is this As you can see, quite a huge excavation took place in this third chamber. Whoever was digging here was digging for something. Uh, Keith Hamilton, using Maragioglio's and Rinaldi's original drawings, calculated that something like 98 cubic metres of stone had been removed, which is somewhere around 280 tonnes. And all this stone had to be pulled out of this chamber, lowered down into the other two chambers, and then taken out of the pyramid, presumably, because it's no longer inside. You may also notice on the back wall of this chamber there is a block of a slightly different colour. Some people think that this may be a doorway to additional chambers within this pyramid. The Red Pyramid really is a massive structure and these chambers really don't take up much of the internal space. A lot of people do theorise that there are other chambers inside this pyramid somewhere. I think this would be a great target for the whole muon detection, cosmic ray detection technology that they've applied to a couple of the other pyramids. I really hope that happens here at some point in the future as well. Looks like this was kind of a focal chamber here. Probably it had a box in here or something, yeah. and that's why they digged, but nobody can be positive. Right. I guess they were digging for something. Yeah, definitely. You can see that, uh, that place where they tightened the room. Yeah. We're looking for something to come here inside here and uh, dig this and break, smash the floor of the entire chamber and dig this much. Somebody was desperate for pressure. Especially that. Uh, imagine just moving out with the broken pieces Top to right. the outside. They must have moved out. So as we make our way out of the pyramid, you might notice some of the holes in the wall where there was likely scaffolding installed. And in fact, there's an area near the entrance to the third chamber that is likely where a chain was installed rather than a rope. In fact, Colonel Howard Weiss reported that one of the original Arabic names for this pyramid was Haram el Silsili, which was on account of a chain that was said to have been suspended from the entranceway of the passage between the second and third chambers. As we go out, I thought I'd leave you with another piece of Yusuf's music. Uh, this was him and his brother Sadat. Yusuf is on the oud, or the Egyptian guitar, and Sadat is on the hand drum. I do hope you all found this video to be interesting. If you are interested in visiting Egypt with Yusuf and myself, we do run those tours on a semi-regular basis every year or two. You can find all that information on my website. It's unchartedx.com, and I'll see you all in the next one. Cheers. <music>
خالص ركنته <تصفيق> 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 <تصفيق>